And we're live in five, four, four three, two, one. Good morning, everyone. My name is Cliff Pierre. I'm one of the fellows here at the Swedish Neuroscience Institute. And I'd like to welcome you to the Cerebrovascular Question and Answer Symposium. Uh, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Sandra Connolly, uh, whom I've known personally for uh, several years now. Uh, Dr. Connolly is currently the uh, Brian Stokey Professor and Chair of the Department of Neurological Surgery at the College of Physician and Surgeons of Columbia University. Uh, currently also serves as the Surgeon in Chief at the New York Neurological Institute and New York Presbyterian Hospital in Columbia, and is the Surgical Director of the Neuro ICU at uh, Columbia Medical Center. Um, uh, Dr. Connolly's clinical practice focuses on uh, microsurgical uh, treatment of patients with cerebral aneurysms, strokes, AVMs, carotid stenosis, moya moya, hemorrhage, and ischemia. Uh, he's one of the nation's experts on uh, such diseases. Uh, he's also the director of the Cerebrovascular Research uh, Laboratory at Columbia. Uh, many of his research focuses on the uh, treatment and management of patients post-stroke, as well as the recovery uh, from brain inflammation. Uh, he's been in, actively involved in many clinical trials and is NIH funded. And uh, currently he serves under, uh, as president of the Society of the Neurological Surgeons and president-elect of the American Academy of Neurological Surgery. Congratulations on that uh, position. And uh, uh, we are glad to have him here. Uh, we talked about it earlier, it might be a setup, but he's gonna discuss a topic of microsurgical clipping of wide neck aneurysms. Uh, without further ado, Dr. Connolly. Clifford and um, Cameron, this is a distinct pleasure. And I, I do think it's like bringing uh, Coles to Newcastle, but I'll, I'll give it my best. Thank uh, you. So let me try to uh, share my screen and let's make sure this works. We tried with Corey before. Is that Can everyone see that okay? Yes, we can. Yeah, it's perfect. Okay. So, uh, the, the title of this talk is Less Can Be More, a continued uh, case for a clipping as an alternative to flow diversion, coiling, and bypass. So as you know, the current state of aneurysm treatment is in great flux. If you go back to 1998, when I finished my residency, and you look at how many aneurysms were being uh, surgically repaired, whether they were ruptured or unruptured, the vast majority were done surgically. Now, the vast majority are really done endovascularly. If you look at uh, 2016 data in the United States, 80% endovascular for unruptured and almost 70% endovascular for ruptured. And I think those numbers have probably creeped up uh, post-pandemic. Um, if you look at what this has meant for outcomes, it's a little grayer. It certainly hasn't made things worse, but it really hasn't changed outcomes, at least in terms of in-hospital mortality very much. Um, if you look outside of the United States, you see exactly the same story. Um, the uh, ruptured aneurysms, about 60% done endovascularly, and unruptured aneurysms, about 70% endovascularly. And if you talk to the people in Germany, it's, it's creeping up, up, up. And that's probably as open a, um, a, a country as there that you'll see uh, in France and in England, it's, it's even less uh, for the open surgery. If you look at what this translates to for training, it's, uh, it's significant. If you look at the US training in micro, microsurgical aneurysm surgery, in those centers where fellowship applications have been su submitted to CAST, so this is the the most gung-ho open microsurgical uh, aneurysm factories, 50% uh, of them treat less than 100 open aneurysms a year. And if you look at the, the numbers that they actually clip, only three programs clip more than 100 aneurysms a year. And these, these programs share a fellow with three to four chief residents. So the number of cases to actually train on in terms of microsurgery is definitely getting smaller and smaller. If, if you look at um, the case index, uh, so by individual fellow, 
and you look at these programs, only one resident in these high, highly enriched programs clipped more than 40 aneurysms during their residency, and only one fellow clipped more than 30 aneurysms during their fellow, uh, fellowship. And the median in one of these fellowships for uh, open clipping is about 23 uh, compared to those that submitted an application it wasn't and it wasn't accepted. So somewhere around 20 is the median number. So not very many open aneurysms to train on. Uh, hold on. If you um, if you look at um, bypass, the state of, of this is even worse. And so you hear a lot of people talking about doing bypasses for wide neck aneurysms, and only one fellow uh, performed greater than 15 bypasses, and only three fellows performed more than 10 bypasses. So pretty, pretty uncommon. Uh, if you look at the state of bypass surgery for aneurysms, it's decreasing as, almost as fast as, um, as open clipping. So this has really become an, an endovascular disease, as, as we all know. Uh, that said, I think that the, while the data suggests that aneurysm, aneurysm surgery, direct aneurysm surgery is less and less common, and that aneurysm surgery training is less and less robust, I think that clipping training in the United States does remain a little bit better than bypass training. And I think this is unfortunate because clipping is actually, can be a really great solution for a large number of aneurysms, at least pending the development of more reliable endovascular devices. I think this will uh, change as the devices get better, but for certain aneurysms, it's still really the simplest solution. And so what I'm going to try to, to convince you today, and, and maybe you'll be convinced and maybe you won't, but that using a couple of case illustrations that aneurysm clipping can be simpler than a Y stent or a bonnet bypass for a distal ACA blowout, that it can be safer than coiling or stent coiling for small ruptured aneurysms and can aid you in identifying which lesion actually bled, that it can prove useful in patients with an absolute or relative contraindication to DAP. This happens with unruptured aneurysms where people have lots of GI bleeding from, from uh, dual antiplatelet agents, medication resistance, allergies, or really poor medical compliance, which is something we see, especially in the uh, unhoused population, or in ruptured aneurysms where you have a lot of blood in the ventricles and they're at high risk for spasm and hydrocephalus. can also prove efficacious in patients with multiple wide neck aneurysms where a single stent construct is unlikely to work. I'll show you a case like that. And it remains the treatment of choice for most wide-necked MCA aneurysms, especially those that are hostile to intrasacular devices as they exist today. And it can prove simpler and less morbid than most bypasses. So here's the first case. It's a pericolosal artery aneurysm. And this is a 52-year-old woman with headaches and recent memory difficulties. And she had a remote history of a motor vehicle accident. She presents with an angiogram showing a pericolosal artery uh, blowout aneurysm that is growing on serial imaging with three major branches coming out of it. You might be able to come up with some sort of bypass for this, or you might be able to figure out a stent coil for this. But what we did was we uh, took her to the operating room for a surgical reconstruction of this. This is done actually in a neutral position. This is how I learned to do this. But obviously doing this lateral with or without a retractor is probably the more modern uh, way to do this. And so uh, the way this is done is you just simply develop a plane between the fox and the brain. I do use light retraction, which is a little controversial because I'm like an old dinosaur. It doesn't really make a big difference. It allows me to move a little more quickly with my hands. And especially if I'm working with a resident who's, who's doing a dissection like this, it just gives me a better feeling that I can get my hands in there if there's if there's a light retraction there. So we're going to get a uh, proximal control of this aneurysm, and then we're going to release it under proximal control from the fox. You know, this is this is an aneurysm that's likely traumatic in in, in origin. Now we're going to work our way around all the branches to see this 365 degrees, so that we can really do what we're going to do next which is we're going to put a 
clip around the back of this uh, superior branch using a fenestration in order to be able to reconstruct it. So I'm going to make sure that all the cleavage planes around this are, are clean. I want to make sure that there are no little perforators or arachnoid bands that are restricting us. And then I'm going to put this fenestrated clip around the superior division. Actually, the resident's going to do this. It's not difficult if you know what you're doing. It's just about judgment, being able to see this 365 degrees. Any, any neurosurgeon at the end of their training should be able to do this. And then we're going to take off the proximal control. And the reason to do this now is I really want to see how much we're going to limit that superior division when we put this kissing clip. So we're going to put this on very deliberately and slowly, and we're going to kind of feel what the parent branch is going to be like so that we don't over brimp it. And now you can see we have a nice uh, repair of this uh, aneurysm. Uh, we're going to Doppler the blood vessels to make sure that they're open. I'm not a big ICG person. We're going to do an intraoperative angiogram, which I do on all these cases to make sure that it's perfectly repaired. And it looks really nice. So that's uh, how we dealt with that. Here's a case of a ruptured pericolosal artery aneurysm. Um, this is a, a lady, 74 years old, multiple known aneurysms. She was being followed and then had the worst headache of her life and was found to have subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, we didn't know which of these aneurysms had bled, and obviously we didn't want to put her through more surgery than she needed to have. None of these seemed to be really great for an endovascular repair. Uh, we thought that the large uh, PCOM aneurysm was likely to be the uh, source of the bleed. We actually explored that aneurysm, and that was not the source of the bleed. And through the same craniotomy, we actually explored that anterior cerebral artery or ACOM region aneurysm, and that was not the source of the bleed. And so we were left with the pericolosal, and you can see that it's very irregular and that there's probably some thrombus in the dome. And so this is done through an inner hemispheric approach. Uh, what I did was I made a second small craniotomy through the same terional skin incision, um, just a small little uh, craniotomy centered off the uh, midline. Uh, again, you see the retraction, which I don't think is a big deal. I'm using a cotinoid as sort of a second retractor deep. Um, we're trying to get the, the um, uh, colossal marginal here. You can see those branches. Um, we're going to be coming down those, and you can start to see the neck of the aneurysm. And I'm going to take out a small piece of brain here. This is like a gyrus rectus resection, but it's really the frontal lobe. And I'm leaving the rupture site on the uh, aneurysm until I have proximal control, and I've been able to completely release the aneurysm 365 degrees around. So I don't want to expose the rupture site until I've got the whole aneurysm uh, repaired. You can see that small branch coming out of it. Um, I'm gonna Doppler that now so that I know what it sounds like in its native state because I don't wanna crimp it when we put this uh, clip on. And uh, I wanna be fairly aggressive with this clip to, in order to cure this aneurysm. She is old, but it's still not a lot of tissue there. I don't want the aneurysm clip to skive off. You look at it 360. We can see that everything's clean. We read Doppler, and then we will also get an intraoperative angiogram here. Um, and you'll see um, that all of the aneurysms, I actually, I think there's a CTA here. All the aneurysms are uh, repaired well. Uh, here's a case of a giant superior hypophyseal, an A2 aneurysm. This is a 33-year-old woman who presented with right-sided visual loss, was found to have this... Uh, 20 millimeter right superior hypophyseal aneurysm, as well as a right A2 blister aneurysm. She's a severe aspirin allergy uh, with anaphylaxis. We could have probably desensitized her to aspirin, but given the um, uh, progressive visual loss, we didn't feel like we had the time for that. And there was some concern that if we pipeline this, that the thrombosis in the aneurysm would actually lead to worsening of her visual symptoms and if we could you know decompress this aneurysm that that would give her the best shot at um, um, uh, uh, vision return 
The issue here is that this aneurysm, normally I would say there's really not a surgical case, but you see that the neck is actually pretty discreet for such a large aneurysm, even though it's still a wide necked aneurysm. So we elected to take this person to the operating room. Uh, here's a sylvian dissection, which I do for almost all anterior circulation aneurysms. Again, I do use um, uh, a, a fixed retractor to allow my hands to, or to, or whose ever hands are in the wound to, to have more uh, freedom of movement. I'm gonna clean out the whole distal carotid here. Now we're gonna take off the clinoid. Um, I do most of the clinoid resections intradurally. Occasionally we'll do an extradural or don't link approach, but I find that most of this can be done intradurally and you can kind of tailor the amount of clinoidal resection uh, based on what you really need. I love the two millimeter diamond. It's what I learned to use. Um, the uh, ultrasonic aspirators are also uh, quite nice and they're trialing a couple of new ones uh, in ENT and maybe I'll switch over at some point. Um, I like the two millimeter because it's a little bigger and so it's um, a little more stable. You can't poke as much with it. Um, here we're uh, opening the uh, falciform ligament, both uh, on the medial side of the optic nerve. I've already opened it on the lateral side of the optic nerve. You're seeing the proximal neck of the aneurysm, and I'm going to reconstruct the carotid here with a fenestrated clip. Any attempt to do this from a, from a uh, non-parallel to the vessel uh, clip construct is going to lead to kinking of the vessel. The only hope you have of clipping this correctly is to clip this in line with the carotid artery. The key danger here, though, is that the clip blades cannot get across the choroidal or the PCOM origin. You see, I'm checking to make sure that that's uh, free, and I'll uh, Doppler that in a second to make sure that's free, but it looks like it's just outside of where we need to be. And so um, that looks good. I'm checking the carotid both before and after. And uh, the, um, the branch there seems good. And we'll get it. Uh, now we're looking across to see that little blister aneurysm. You'd have probably left that alone and not worried about it if you had done a, a pipeline. But since we're there, we're going to clip this aneurysm. These are can be very treacherous. I'm using a uh, alligator clip to get that kind of just in line with the ACA, because that's the way that the vessel is going to roll together in order to uh, provide a, a good cure there. This is what her post-operative angiogram looked like, and uh, we decompress that aneurysm by sticking a needle in it once we had the angiogram, uh, and, it, and, it, um, and her vision actually did get better. Uh, here's a ruptured ACOM and proximal ICA aneurysm. This is a 57-year-old uh, male smoker, IV, dr IV drug abuser, non-compliant with his medications, presents with uh, Hunt has three, Miller Fisher four, subarachnoid hemorrhage, that frontal lobe clot um, from an anterior communicating artery aneurysm that's uh, somewhat wide-necked and irregular. Uh, he also has a, a second intradural aneurysm off the ICA, which is also wide-necked, uh, which is unruptured. So uh, given the lack of ability to um, use a stent here without, you know, dual antiplatelet agents um, and the wide neck nature of that uh, ACOM neck, uh, we felt that this would be better dealt with this way. The other thing is we don't have to have him get any, you know, follow-up uh, angiograms or anything like that, which he's not going to come back for. Uh, we're going to take out a little gyrus rectus here. That's a vein on the surface. Don't worry about those. Do try to stay a bit off of the olfactory if you're going to uh, not have problems with olfaction. Uh, here we're, uh, we're releasing the brain from the dome in the same way that we did with the uh, pericolosal artery uh, aneurysm. I'm leaving uh, brain attached to the rupture site so as to not disrupt it while we work all the way around. I'm getting control of the contralateral A1 in order to uh, get flow arrest here which will allow us to manipulate the aneurysm more carefully. We can now see the, uh, the um, orbital frontal here. I'm, I'm moving that, making sure that that branch is not going to restrict us as the clip blades go down. Looking at the contralateral neck, making sure we're not going to get 
contralateral Huebner, which you can kind of see poking out over there now. Um, moving the uh, the ACA back so that we have a nice uh, uh, area here. I really would not like to do this without uh, temporary occlusion. We're now going to look down the back wall 360 to make sure we can see the hypothalamic perforators. Uh, sometimes you'll see little branches here that are not true hypothalamic perforators. And, that, and if you can see them going directly into the brain, you can take those to mobilize this. It's not a, a bad idea sometimes. Again, we're looking at one of these uh, side biting clips to try to roll this aneurysm in line with the blood vessel. We didn't like the view there. And so we're going to re reposition our uh, scope so that we get a better view down the back wall here. Um, we're going to reposition everything, get that sucker down the back wall so that we can see what we're doing and uh, put this clip in. You can see how wide neck this aneurysm is. If you just simply coil this, this aneurysm is gonna come back and this patient's not coming back to, for, for treatment. So um, to do the right thing by this person, we really wanna get a, uh, a really nice clipping here. And so here comes the clip. It's gonna be released very slowly. I think this is a good way to avoid an intraoperative rupture. If it doesn't feel right, you can always back out. And there you have the uh, primary clipping. There's going to be a little uh, dog ear underneath this as we take off our uh, clips. I would leave this if I wasn't using intraoperative angiography, but since we have intraoperative angiography, we're going to make sure that that dog ear is exactly perfect. Um, I'm even up against a little athro, you see that, in the, in the uh, A2 there, but it's a perfect repair. We're going to now come back over to the clinoid. We're going to resect the uh, clinoid on this side, in a very similar methodology to what we did before. I can maybe move this along to not bore you with that. And uh, this is the aneurysm that's on the other side. This is a very thick-walled aneurysm that probably could have been left alone if, if you really wanted to, but he's a fairly young patient in his 50s. This has to be, the, the entire carotid ring has to be removed. The aneurysm has to really be released from the wall of the cavernous sinus in order to safely clip this. Um, uh, and so we're, we're making sure that we're all the way around the back wall. Because it's a thick-walled aneurysm, I'm going to use a fenestrated clip. I'm not using it for the fenestration. It just has a stronger closing strength than a non-fenestrated clip. And you'll see that it's going to leave a little neck open there. That's okay. I'm looking back to make sure we're completely across the neck. It does look like we are and that we don't have any perforators, any superior hypophyseal or pecan perforators. We're proximal to pecans, so we're not going to see any of those. But you can get a hypophyseal perforator. And then I'm going to back this up with a second clip to try to gather that, that thick-walled area with you know kind of compressing you can see that even with the fenestrated clip it scissors then i put a second clip right there in the in the additional fenestration and then we'll get an intraoperative angiogram we're dopplering to make sure that that looks okay it does and this is what that angiogram looks like ica looks very good you can see and the acom repair is excellent another uh wide neck aneurysm is this giant ica aneurysm uh, it's, um, and, uh, I also have a right ophthalmic and posterior communicating artery aneurysms. You can see that this 40 year old woman with Graves disease and a GI bleed and a family history of fatal aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage was found to have this giant ICA aneurysm as well as a right ophthalmic and posterior communicating artery aneurysms. There's also a, a cave aneurysm that's in the cavernous sinus, um, Given her age and everything, it definitely uh, needs to be treated. There, there might be a bypass solution here that you could you could dream up, but it's going to be complicated. And you could try to stent this, but getting a stent to reconstruct the ICA bifurcation is going to be complicated. And um, so we felt that it, it was at least reasonable to try to see if we could get this repaired surgically. So same as... Uh, some of the things you've seen before, wide splitting of the uh, sylvian fissure. I do this with a beaver blade, but our other arachnoid knives like apex knives are quite nice. Um, we're gonna uh, dissect out the entire ICA here. That's the uncus being moved uh, laterally. We're gonna 
uh, this is um, release of the frontal lobe here um, from the optic nerve. Um, nothing that you haven't seen a million times before. See if we can move along here. We're uh, preparing to trap the ICA, and we're going to trap the uh, the ICA aneurysm with a clip on the carotid, as well as the A1 and the M1, where they're going to open up the aneurysm and suck out the contents of this aneurysm. Um, this is uh, it being done with uh, uh, neural monitoring to make and uh, and burst suppression to protect the brain. We're sucking out the clot. I don't do a lot of tumor surgery, almost none. And so I'm not super comfortable with the uh, the cavitron, especially in these small spaces. And so what I what I do is I try to just dissect the clot itself away, away from the internal wall of the aneurysm, and then we'll get that aneurysm reconstructed. Then we'll open up the, uh, the proximal um, uh, ring here in order to uh, get close to the uh, proximal aneurysm. There's a, a, a story in this, if you'll see in a second, we're gonna move along. Um, and as I'm clipping this aneurysm and you see how wide necked it is, um, you'll have to angle your clip blades a little bit, yes, back to uh, drop that second clip blade more towards the carotid and you'll see that I'm going to miss clipping this aneurysm. And you're gonna see aneurysm behind that clip. You have to reposition that clip in order to get it all the way across the aneurysm. You see there's residual aneurysm there. Um, this is done under a temporary occlusion in the neck. Um, and then you'll come across there. And then that's nice. And you can see that the perforator's free and that aneurysm's repaired. And then we'll turn our attention to the um, choroidal artery aneurysm over here on the side. Um, and you'll see that this is actually gonna be, oh, that's a little uh, dog ear that we're fixing with a little microclip. And then we're gonna come over here and address this choroidal aneurysm, which is thin walled and blister-like. This probably actually gave me more angina than the other two aneurysms as it turned out. These can be really treacherous, even when they're in an unruptured state, they can sometimes bleed on you. Um, and, and, the, and if they do, they have almost no tissue left to repair. You put a piece of muscle in there and clip across the muscle if that happens. This again is done under uh, flow arrest in the neck and we'll reconstruct that. We're pushing down strongly on the origin of the PCOM in order to get it to repair. And there you go. And so that's that. And that's what this looks like. And the only thing that's left is this little carotid cave aneurysm. Very nice result, um, good repair, um, and but something that would be very complicated with a bypass or stent. Here's a right MCA aneurysm. This is a 42-year-old woman with poorly controlled hypertension, presents with headaches and tr transient global amnesia, and she has this sessile right uh, MCA aneurysm. Um, this is something that really is going to be hard to repair with a uh, um, an intrasacular device, and no stent really works well for this. And so this is a pretty straightforward um, surgery. This is done through kind of a mini craniotomy. You've heard people doing this through the orbit or through the eyelid. What we like to do is a, just a terional incision, but then we don't take down the temporalis muscle. We just uh, undercut it a little bit, put a little burr hole, and turn a very small uh, uh, craniotomy that's frontal. It does make splitting the fissure a little diff difficult because you're actually underneath the dura, but you can see you can get a, a pretty good look at this. And then as the CSF comes off, you can kind of drag the the, the whole frontal lobe into the field. And then you uh, just dissect this uh, aneurysm out. You can see it's a little gooey in there, but no true um, uh, evidence of prior hemorrhage. Um, I like to do this mostly sharply with scissors. Um, you'll see the aneurysm coming into view and there's a little 
a, a unrelated aneurysm that we didn't even see on the original angiogram that's proximal, very similar to that ACA aneurysm we showed you before. We're going to clip that with a small clip, again, in line with the with the uh, main axis of the M1. Um, you'll see that we're going to get all the way around this aneurysm, and I have no hesitation about taking out a small piece of brain. Uh, I just give perioperative anticonvulsant, just a single uh, 1,000 milligrams of keparin, then never again, so we send them home. Haven't had any problems taking out these small areas of, of, of uh, brain. Um, and once the, uh, the aneurysm is completely released, we'll get a tiny little side biting clip there on the, uh, that little aneurysm. Again, pushing down to try to make sure you get all the meat of it. That looks like a good repair there. And then again, one of these alligator clips to try to uh, make sure we're clipping in line with the MCA bifurcation. You can see how uh, wide neck this is. Uh, but again, not a technical tour de force, as long as you take your time to completely release the aneurysm from all the surrounding tissue. Um, I can't remember if there's a little dog ear here, but if there is, we're going to um, correct that with a little uh, clip as well. And yep, there I go. We're going to put a little dog ear clip on there to make sure that's repaired as well. And then you'll get an intraoperative uh, angiogram. And that looks uh, very nice as well. You can see that this is a perfect repair. Um, here's a case that's a little more complicated. This is a growing recanalized ICA uh, uh, aneurysm. Um, this patient's a 53-year-old gentleman with hypertension, hyperlipidemia, prior infarct with a residual left hemiparesis. He's already on DAPT um, for uh, coronary stents. He had a ruptured right carotid terminus uh, aneurysm that was stent coiled in 2016, and that was complicated by hydrocephalus. So he also has a left frontal VP shunt, and he presents with subacute uh, decline with uh, both in functional and cognitive status and a worsening left hemiparesis and abulia. And you'll see that the aneurysm is recanalized through the stent and it's partially filling and thrombosed, and there's evidence of perianeurysmal bleeding together with right frontal lobe edema and trapping of the right frontal horn. So this is kind of your worst case uh, coil nightmare, if you will. You can see the coil mass up in here. Um, the aneurysm is just growing through the, the, the tines. It's trapping this uh, horn that shunts it in over here, you'll see later. It's causing all this edema, mass effect, and shift. And the options really were to re-stent, so to stick another pipeline across the original pipeline. Uh, and uh, But we thought that perhaps we could trap the origin of this. And I would never do this had I not operated on uh, previously pipeline carotids before. If you try to, to reconstruct this without the pipeline in, in situ, without completely decompressing this aneurysm, which I think would be very dangerous, um, then you'll end up kinking the carotid. There's just no way around it. But with the pipeline as your scaffold, I thought that we might be able to do it and that it was worth exploring it. So um, you'll see the preoperative images there. Uh, it's a real mess. There's the bleed site into the frontal lobe. And so this, what we did here was we did kind of a large craniectomy. So I ne knew I needed to decompress the brain and I was gonna leave the craniotomy out for a period of weeks, um, maybe even a month or so. And, um, and then I was gonna come down here and isolate the neck of the aneurysm and then trap it off the ICA and take the the A1 that's coming in from the other side. So we're doing this very carefully because we decided to leave the patient on aspirin. Um, we did stop the Plavix, but I felt very nervous about stopping all antiplatelet agents given the fact that there's a, uh, a stent in the uh, ICA and M1. You'll get to see that stent in a few seconds. Um, we're coming down M1 here. There's your anterior temporal branch below the... Uh, uh, MCA bifurcation. We're uh, opening up the, um, the the fissure here. We're being super careful not to stir up any bleeding because we're on aspirin. 
Uh, we're doing as much of this as we can uh, sharply. I don't know if you can appreciate this, but you can see the pressure from the aneurysm under the sucker. That's all the aneurysm itself, even with the hemicraniectomy, it's really pushing strongly against us. Now you can see the, uh, the distal ICA, and you can start to see the tines of the stent uh, to the left under the, uh, to the right under the sucker. And uh, we're isolating the A1 now coming in. There's your A1, there's your M1. That's the stent, and that's the residual coil mass. And uh, you'll see how we um, um, begin to, uh, this is the just a diagram of where the blood is getting into this aneurysm. Some of it's coming through the stent, some of it's coming through the contralateral A1. And so kind of a simple clip repair here is gonna be to trap this aneurysm. And so the way I felt that this would be best is to actually clip off the, the ACA and the neck of the aneurysm along the stent. So we're making a nice uh, pathway here, making sure that Huebner and all the perforators are free, and then um, putting an angled uh, dissector behind the aneurysm to make sure that we're free. And then you see how much resistance there is against that stent. So we're just pushing to make sure that we have a nice safe place to put our clip. There's the end of the aneurysm. And we're going to put this, um, uh, we're going to Doppler to make sure that that stent is open because I'm going to clip this and I want to make sure that the flow is not uh, diminished. I'm just putting a straight clip straight along the, the, basically the aspect of the prior pipeline stent. And I'm avoiding the perforators back there. You can see I'm kind of skiving along them and uh, we'll just, drop that like that. And if I did that without the stent in there, that would completely kink the uh, ICA to M1 uh, flow. But because the stent's there as a scaffold, it's holding everything open. We have very nice flow up the MCA. Now I'm coming back to the ACA because that's obviously filling into the aneurysm as well, I'm trying to avoid this tiny perforator. So we're going to use a curved uh, mini clip here to kind of just get the origin of that that ACA and that clip goes in just like this leaving that perforator open and then we'll inspect and make sure that everything's free and it is and that's a pretty simple repair for that uh, very complex aneurysm this is what the intraoperative angiogram looks like the ICA fills beautifully up the, the right side. The M1 looks great. It's like no big deal. P patient does have two other aneurysms that may need to get dealt with uh, down the road. But you can see the old A1 fills all the way up. And the perforator that we missed is still filling, which is quite nice. And this is what he looks like. Um, a couple of weeks later, you can see the craniectomy is still there. The aneurysm's already started to shrink. The edema in the frontal lobe is better. The, and the guy looks like a million bucks. And so he's still, he's still on um, uh, aspirin. In fact, he had to go on uh, uh, Eliquis for um, uh, a DVT and a pulmonary embolism. But he's doing great with that. He's in rehab, working nicely, and I think in the next month or so, he'll, we'll stop his anticoagulation and bring him back for a peak cranioplasty. So probably a really uh, a good solution to a very complicated problem. So I, I hopefully these cases show you that clipping can sometimes be the easiest, safest thing to do, even though there's some great endovascular devices and bypasses do have their place. I think judgment and patience are the key to uh, clipping at least, and then it can be taught with not that many cases, but it's part of that is because as you can see from these cases, there's not really a lot of tech, tech, technical virtuosity involved in them, just kind of making sure that you kind of understand the disease and that you're set up for success. Um, I think there are always several ways to manage these cases, and I, I really am a firm believer that endovascular is the, the first-line therapy for a lot of what we do. 
but the the enemy is not bypass or clipping or you know an endovascular approach the enemy is this this is a guy 60 years old who has this four millimeter wide neck acom aneurysm and because it doesn't meet criteria for some neurologists they say this really shouldn't be treated and you see this in your practice every day. There's a lot of consternation. Should this be dealt with or not? This patient even comes back uh, two years later with headaches and they re-image him and the aneurysm looks stable. And so they say there's really nothing to do. And then he has a fatal subarachnoid hemorrhage. It's a true case from a couple of weeks ago. So I think that um, however you uh, wade into this disease, you, you want to be... Um, you know, cognizant that um, there are lots of ways to deal with this. So with that, I'll uh, thank everyone for the opportunity. Clifford, it was really a pleasure to come. Hopefully I didn't incite Cameron and give him too much angina. It probably brought back like uh, PTSD from his time in Phoenix. But um, it, I, I really want to say, I mean, as time goes on, nothing would make me happier than to not have to clip an aneurysm. Um, I thought that my carotid practice would be dead, that they'd all get stented. That hasn't really happened, uh, but we stent a lot of carotids. Um, the one place where I've, I've seen a really uh, diminishment of microsurgery is in AVM surgery. So here in New York, for an unruptured AVM, I mean, everyone's going to dance all over themselves to figure out some radiosurgical solution to that, to that case. It's just, it's, surgery is, is definitely second. And that's not because of Aruba. It's just because people just don't want to have their heads open. Um, the only bypasses that I really do, um, I'll do an occasional one for an aneurysm, but it's really for Moya Moya. And I don't do direct bypasses, except if somebody's having like crescendo flow failure. Most of them are treated with an EDAS, which is a simple operation you can teach to any resident. Um, and, you know, anesthesia times two hours and anesthesia is the risk. So I think that um, with that, I'll turn it over to the, to the group and they can ask some questions. Thanks. Thank you again, Dr. Connolly, for that great talk. Um, I see uh, one of our cerebrovascular neurosurgeons, Dr. Monteith, has his hands raised for, with a question. Thanks, Clifford. Thanks, Dr. Connolly. That was a, a great talk. Sorry, I missed your introduction because, uh, ironically, we have a ruptured uh, uh, three and a half millimeter wide necked MCA that we're uh, getting to the OR to clip. Uh, and we have a pericolosal that we're clipping, which also has a wide neck uh, in another patient. So um, we're still clipping too. Um, and I had some, some questions. Uh, for the superior hypophyseals that you uh, were clipping, do you prophylactically open the neck? Um, for those cases? So I have a case from, from yesterday that's a superior hypophyseal. I mean, superior hypophyseal is something that in general is not a ruptured aneurysm. And so I do like stenting for that aneurysm in, in most cases. And, and maybe it's just from my own personal experience, but sometimes it's very hard to get, we'll get to the whether to come, contralateral, ipsilateral, and all that. But regardless of how you approach it, often the superior hypophyseal artery comes out of it. And the hypophyseal artery should go to the hypophysis, right? But there are often branches to the chiasm off of it. And I've had some people uh, with, over the years who've had some really squirrely um, visual field deficits from, from compromising that. And I have not seen that from stenting. So my default for hypophyseal is generally to, to do it endovascularly. That said, I did one just yesterday um, and I debated whether I should come contralateral, ipsilateral. And if I come contralateral, I will do them neutral and I'll do a neck dissection on the side of the, of the unless it's a very small aneurysm. And this is a pretty big aneurysm, pretty wide neck, uh, dug into the cavernous sinus the neck's not in the cavernous sinus, but the aneurysm dome is into the cavernous sinus. And she presented with uh, headaches, but no subarachnoid hemorrhage, but she has two siblings who've died of subarachnoid hemorrhage from aneurysms, but she's undocumented. And we couldn't get her insurance to pay for Plavix. 
And so we got into this big debate of, you know, how could we do this and should we give it a shot at surgery? And so we did it ipsilateral, um, standard stuff, Sylvian Fisher split, open the carotid ring. I was really happy that I done that. It looked a little bit like that, that giant superior hypophyseal. It's a, it's a smaller aneurysm than what I did yesterday. But I actually had to go into the the cavernous sinus and you know pack off a little bit with small cotton balls in order to get the proximal blades where I really wanted them to reconstruct it. And she did great, no visual field problems. BI. So and I saw the superior hypothesis it was big. I mean, she'll recover from her DI, but not without complications. So that's not. It's not like a pipeline where they like go home the next day. They, there's, you know, morbidity associated with that. So, you know, I would say that the vast majority of hypotheses that I clip, I'm usually clipping them contralateral. They're really small and I'm there in the brain for some other reason. I'm there for a wide neck ACOM or some ICA bifurcation aneurysm that's sessile, maybe ruptured, um, that doesn't look good for coiling. Um, so I do like that contralateral approach. It really depends on where the chiasm is though. If you get a prefix chiasm, you got no room to, to operate. The one thing I haven't done, which you've seen written about, and I've never done this, and I, but I've looked to see if I could do it and I've never been comfortable, is clipping an MCA from the other side. Ah, uh, 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 yeah, you're a man. Yeah, I got it. But <laughs> I've never done that. I've never really seen seen that well enough and I've just told people you got to come back and I'll do it the other the other way. They don't love that, but yeah, I'll send them to Seattle the next time I see. Yeah, them. I, I, I'd stopped doing it since we got the web, um, yeah. but I, I, it, it actually was my boards case, which uh, I thought I was going to fail my boards, but Dan Barrow gave me a pass, so uh, I got away with that but one. You got the right. You got the right examiner. That's I, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I was pretty nervous before that. Um, uh, second, that that's a great answer. Um, Second you question. like you like web back at you. We have not had a lot of great experience with web. Um, you know, um, I've done a FDA review. There are a fair number of complications writ large, maybe not in expert hands. And we're starting to see people with like recurrences after web. And yeah. um, I, I just I don't think that's going to be what we land on. They're going to get a great intrasacular device, but I got a I got a feeling web is not it. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. I think there's there's a wave of enthusiasm and probably some undersizing when it first came out. Um, Dr. McDougall has been a proponent of the uh, contour device, so we'll we'll see. Um, my other question was about training. Um, yeah, as every year the number of aneurysm clippings goes down and uh, we have fellows, we don't have residents, but um, as fellows come in, the level of experience they've had during residency kind of diminishes with with each year that goes by. In terms of your uh, trainees, do you think it's better training them on uh, elective aneurysms when some would argue the stakes are higher uh, versus uh, ruptured aneurysms where the brain is more hostile and and it's kind of more difficult or doesn't matter, just help them along in, in each case? Yeah. I'm not that facile a surgeon. So the way I operate on a ruptured aneurysm or an unruptured aneurysm uh, sets sets me up for complete control. Like I, I just can't have an intraoperative rupture. It's like, it drives me crazy. And so I don't find that training a resident on a ruptured or unruptured aneurysm really is that different. Um, I would say that by the end of residency, they all can do a, a straightforward ruptured or unruptured aneurysm from our shop. I think a lot of the reason they can do that though has nothing to do with the aneurysm training. It's the, the fact that it's a very robust microsurgical experience on tumors. So they have the, the skill sets to move their hands under the microscope. They understand the movement of tissues and everything. And they've seen enough aneurysms to know that if you have to do something difficult technically in aneurysm surgery, then unless you're like Dan Barrow, you should not be doing it. So like, we're not, we're not sending people out to say, 
oh, go clip a poster projecting basal or aneurysm, even if it's small. Like they're not coming away with that judgment. That's not happening. What they're really looking at clipping is, you know, wide necked ICA bifurcation aneurysms, often that are ruptured, because if they're unruptured and they're not an aneurysm surgeon, they're probably not doing that. Um, or an MCA. That's probably 90% of what they're doing. Most of the ACOMs in the world out there, somebody's figuring out a solution to coil them, recoil them, stent coil them, what have you. And so the place where we really don't have a great solution today are small ICA bifurcation, MCA bifurcation aneurysms in the ruptured setting. And so that's kind of the skill set that I'm trying to pass on. Eventually, we should have an endovascular solution to those where that's really robust. Um, Any time that like we try to do something that's a little outside of our endovascular comfort zone, we end up having to do a lot of backflips to get us out of it. Often we can get the patient through it without a lot of problems. But um, there was a wide-necked ACOM that, um, you know, recently had to get a stent put across the neck, and we got an intraoperative rupture, and then we had to fish a clot out of the MCA. Lots of complicated stuff. Patient didn't have a stroke, did okay, but I'm. it's one of those cases where had had I been in town, we would have probably just clipped it because it, it just, it was hostile for an endovascular technique. So I think it's one of these things where until we have the right device, if you have people who do clipping, then it's, then it's great. It's still a, a good thing. And you don't have to do that many if you operating a lot under the microscope to do the simple aneurysms. I think once an aneurysm is complex for clipping, I'm always thinking about an endovascular solution, whatever they can come up with. And if and if it doesn't require um, a lot of risk to the patient, but it's annoying because like, for instance, it's a ruptured situation and you have to have dual antiplatelets, we've come up with all kinds of ways to deal with that. So my favorite thing is with the drains, they go in before. Uh, we haven't had a lot of problems with tract hemorrhages developing if they didn't have a tract hemorrhage. And then I don't take the drains out. So I wean them. And if they have to go to a shunt, then um, I cut the, the catheter off at the skull, even though it's been in there for 10 days or whatever. It's an antibiotic uh, impregnated catheter. And, and the, the piece that's out of the, you know, the skin is very distal to it. Cut it off, put an angled uh, um, um, connector on it. And then I shunt them to the uh, to the jugular vein with a vascular surgeon, you know, on antiplatelet agents. Had not had a problem doing that. If if they clear their their drain, so they don't need the drain, I go in and I wet clip it at the bone and I leave it there. And if it ever becomes a problem in the future, I can take it out after they don't have to be on the DAPT. We haven't had any problems. So we can dance around DAPT in subarachnoid hemorrhage. I think it's a doable thing, um, but it's something that I, I'd rather not do if we don't have to. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's always a, a challenge with the dual antiplatelet therapy. We do the same thing. We cut the, the shunt at the bone and, and then we either do it laparoscopically. Uh, yeah, or... the lap, lap works as well. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The problem is you still have to tunnel. I still have to tunnel from the belly. It's, to the, it's so it's so gentle. It's so <laughs> so gentle. They they can get some pretty nasty hematomas there. But yeah. anyway, that's the nice thing about going to the jug, and the vascular surgeons are so good at it. it takes two seconds. I, I learned that from Guy McCann, who uh, Cameron knows, because he does a lot of NPH and the the VA shunts. We never did them as residents, but. They do so well in the NPH patients, and they're they they work just fine for the subarachnoid hemorrhage population as well. Yeah, I have to try it. I want to jump in just a, just for a sec. Uh, you know, beautiful presentation. I I love watching beautiful aneurysm clippings. I really do. Um, but I I think you're underestimating a little bit the virtuosity of it. I mean, you you make it look simple because you're making decisions 
ahead of time. And I think in the, in the training programs, I think that's really uh, the challenge. You know, you, uh, most of the residents in good programs are coming out with with you know great technical skills, but I don't I don't know that they really have that sort of decision making ability that allows you know the the kind of videos you showed us where everything is just so you know beautifully thought out ahead of time and the judgment is all there and and I think I think you're right about the MCAs you know I'm I'm probably the most um clip uh, advocating member of our group here I I think I'm these guys are often finding end of last year solutions when I'm thinking why don't you just clip it um but you know, we have a group here who's who's doing a large volume of annuals, and they they've made these decisions. They've gotten into trouble, and I think even in the end of Astro world, the the rapidity with which a case can turn to still uh, is is you know until you've experienced it a few times is is uh, hard to really appreciate. And I, I think that's really the training challenge is is getting that judgment and and people not getting the trouble in the first place. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think that that judgment, if if we're doing neurosurgical training right, is something that is they should be learning in all of the, their cases. So the same things apply to spine surgery. The same things apply to um, functional surgery. You really want to stay out of trouble. Like <laughs> if it is so hard to get out of trouble once you're in trouble, that then takes like virtuosity and quick thinking and sometimes talent. But staying out of trouble just takes humility and talking to people and paying attention. And so I think that if they're learning the same kind of, you know, cautious, stay out of trouble, don't fuse a level that doesn't need to be fused, right? Um, you know, if you can come up with a simple solution with lit, don't, you know, go doing something that's more complicated. Um, I think that that's where the judgment is. It's like it's seven years of reinforcing the judgment. And then for the aneurysms themselves, if you can't see the whole aneurysm and you're not prepared to fully, you know, expose the aneurysm, then you really can't clip it correctly. And so I think that's the the take home that I would leave people with. You have to be, you have to have a plan that's gonna keep you out of trouble where you're gonna be able to completely expose the aneurysm. If you can do that, then it's no big deal. It's like the old videos that Yasser Gil would show where he's taking the clip, he clipping it, cauterizing it, taking the clip off, looking at it. I mean, I never do that. But it's like he's so confident because he has the whole thing laid out. It's it's just there. And if you can't see it, you can't do it safely. So I think that that's kind of the the mantra that I would take is that, you know, it's it's so I did a basilar recently and uh, it was like a blister basilar and it was ruptured and I can't rem remind myself why I, I got talked into this by the end of ASSO people. And it was so scary for me because while I could, I had fine basilar artery control um, and, the, and I do think the OZ is super helpful for that, not necessarily for high riding, but it puts your hands and your, and the light so much closer. Um, but I just was like, I've got one, if this clip doesn't work, this is, this is, it's like end, like it's end game. No, nope, no plan B. And I, and I hate being in a situation where I don't have plan B and plan C. And, and so I think the judgment on surgery is if you don't have plan B and plan C, you better be talking to a lot of people about what, what you're doing. And it's gotta be really necessary. And you you see these problems in other areas. I mean, looks great. I'm gonna do you know saw a case recently uh, C two to the pelvis. You're like C two to the pelvis. You're like they're doing C two to the pelvis for head on head on um, chin or whatever. And and then the patient comes back. They fell at home. 
and now they have an odontoid fracture and they're all messed up. And they're like, you know, the guy's like, I can't believe that that happened. And it, it, it we were in the M&M &M and the other guy's like, I had that happen to me. I had that happen to me. I had that happen to me. <laughs> and so, but the, but the conclusion wasn't like, you shouldn't be doing C2 to the pelvis because the spine can't take those forces. Like it, it really is a lot of what we do is, is judgment. It's like paying attention. It's not the technical stuff. And now with, you know, the internet and communication being better and things like what you're doing with the Seattle Science Foundation, I think we can see a lot. If you have the technical skills, it's really about the judgment and the judgment starts with, I need a plan A, plan B and plan C. And I want to do the least risky thing for the patient. And so sometimes the least risky thing is just a clip. And it's also the least technically difficult thing to do as well. And until we have better devices, I think that's what I would advocate for. That said, I think it's great that there are centers that are really pushing the envelope on intrasacular devices, because I do think that is the future. And eventually somebody's going to have the aha moment and we're going to have the device that that puts this to rest. Um, and so I, you know, I mean, there's been no better invention for the open CV surgeon than pipeline in my career. I mean, they, no more cardiac arrest for those giant, you know, you know, ICA aneurysms. We went through the long vein bypasses. Those were great, except when they weren't. And I mean, and it's just taken, it's just made my life as a surgeon so much better. I love pipeline. I mean, I just, but again, it took a long time for somebody to get to that. And, and pipeline two was so much better than pipeline one. And, and the devices are going to get better and better and better. And eventually they're going to have something that you can probably put in with just aspirin, which is going to be a huge benefit. Um, and so I just, I'm really bullish on endovascular. I also think that, you know, what we're seeing, you know, around the country is that it's just not aneurysms and AVMs and carotid disease you know, it's tinnitus and, um, you know, intracranial hypertension and intracranial hypotension and all these other diseases that we never really uh, treated. And maybe all the functionals going endovascular and maybe tumors going endovascular with, you know, blood brain barrier disruption and intraarterial delivery of chemotherapy. I mean, I'm super bullish on endovascular. It is vascular. That's, that's where we're going. But Sometimes the the microsurgical piece is just simpler with what we have today. I think it's absolutely true, and I'm I'm gonna I'm nominating you for the uh, SNIS presidency. I, I I like the way you're thinking. Uh, it's it's been really wonderful spending time with you this morning, Sandra. I really appreciate you uh, coming and talking to us. It was a great presentation. Well, thanks for having me, Clifford. I really appreciate the invitation, and Doctor, enjoy your aneurysms today. <laughs> we will <laughs> especially the ruptured one i'm sure oh it'll be fine <laughs> All right. thank you thanks for coming have a great day Bye.